Thank you for joining us in our second of this amazing book about the history chronicling the self-colonization of psychology and then the preceding or the next colonization of the world that psychology has wrought, how it has destroyed so much and is responsible, takes responsibility for nothing. The history of psychology here is baffling indeed and we're not even talking about the issue with psychology with regards to the crisis of the sciences thank you for joining me i have here my pomegranate juice real pomegranate from organic from azerbaijan that's where you got to get it from let's get started shall we unsilencing beside reading the silenced voices of in psychoanalytic history and actually one more preface before we continue i'm also researching how they make rumi or molana into a big deal in islamic theory in islamic circles in sufi circles but the whole reason why rumi is a big deal is because they have shut up another guy his name is shamza tabriz and that guy you know, i'm gonna drink for him this is for him you know and all the people who were silenced by platforming the straw man versions of them because one of them is much more radical and you can look at the global theory industry google that one it's not my work uh the only problem i have with the global theory industry is they also reproduce they socially reproduce a lot of the things that i'm crit critiquing here but in a way it's the same vein it comes in the same vein you have to bow down to some structure in order to get published these days and who am i to talk about this stuff i'm somebody who's been reading, working on philosophy for most of my life, I think. It's, you know, a long time. And I teach philosophy, I think about it, I write about it, and you can take a look at all of my work on my YouTube, or you can take a look at my work called Carrying Over the Burdens of Trace by Googling it, or you can take a look at my website, gotbrain.com or gotbrain.ca. Or let's get started. Unsilencing. So besides bringing Adler, Ferenczi, Fromm, and so many others back into our conversations, even though Fromm is a big deal now, I think Adler's is also a big deal now. I think, again, Fromm was brought back into the fold, even if all this stuff was happening. Besides attempting to deconstruct authoritarian structures that do the silencing even now, what else can we, psychoanalysts, do about the problem of silencing? I have a few suggestions, mostly addressed to my fellow senior colleagues concerning training and our ongoing communal life, <laughs> and do hope others will supplant, supplement them. 1. In training, let us teach to our students to read every text critically, asking for its intellectual coherence, underlying philosophical assumptions, and practical clinical implications. What does the author, from whatever school of thought, take for granted about human nature, about race, gender, and sexuality, about what matters and what is real? How would it be to this author's, would the ideas have applicability to some patients other than others? More applicability to some patients than others? Does this author model intellectual humility just as children early on to become critical readers of all media, books, television, and social media, if they are to become participating citizens, our candidates deserve the same respect from us. Everything we say to them will then be grist for the critical mill. An institute where such open inquiry prevails will less likely become a pathological accommodation factory like those described by Kirstner and Brandshaft, or a cult like those addressed by Shaw. Supposedly, there's supposed to be a, a great shift taking place in psychology right now. Psychoanalysts, I've never really, I think psychoanalysts have been in a better stage because it's always put the void in the beginning, in the, in the forefront, at least Lacanian psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysts can engage in a more interdisciplinary study. Uh, again, this is... She's going back to the same kinds of kind of things, same kinds of suggestions that we've been hearing for a while. Though medita medically trained himself, few professional roots were open to Jews in the late 19th century Vienna. Freud always adamantly opposed reducing psychoanalysts, psychoanalysis to a medical specialty, and I believe would have supported those of us opposed to the conflation of the STEM practice fields with psychoanalysis. Here, I don't know. That's a that's a debate. You can, uh, you know, read Freud however you like. Some people think that Freud is very scientism 
It's himself. Freud linked psychoanalysis with history, the arts, literature, and the like, and welcomed into the study and practice of psychoanalysis scholars from these areas. However, Freud was also really into, you know, trying to figure things out, neuro neuroscience-wise. Both Freud and Jung left medical psychiatry, which both found reductionistic for psychoanalysis and analytical psychology. Well, Freud left probably, or perhaps because the scientific instruments were just not even considered afterwards. And I'm a big critic of Jung coming from the Zizekian perspective. And you can take a look at my Ritual Traces series. Senior psychoanalysis can take a special interest in examining the ideas of psychoanalytic dissidents. We not we need not agree, but our candidates need exposure to these ideas, as well as the history of repression. What we do not remember, we are doomed to repeat. We're repeating it right now. Look what's happening to Jordan Peterson. I'm not a big fan of Jordan Peterson. Look at what the College of Psychologists are doing, the Ontario College of Psychologists are doing to him. They're attacking him on baseless grounds. Putting up a video about that soon. We can support our younger colleagues coaching them on a strategy, but more importantly, encouraging them to speak up. Given the experiences of many of us, it would be foolish to tell them to take risks without warning them and without standing by them. My younger colleagues need to hear from me my story of being booed loud and long in Hamburg, August 2001, at a suicidality conference. My crime had been to suggest that instead of attempting or committing suicide as an act of hatefulness against their analysts, suicidal patients might actually be suffering. People don't listen to other people's traumas. It's too much emotional labor. They might deserve our compassion, accompaniment, and mourning. This experience shocked me into silence for a year or two. Yeah. That was in 2001 and mourning. I also went through something like this, right? I talked about it in my uh, other video from prescribed intersectionality, from anthropology to prescribed intersectionality. This experience shocked me into silence for a year or two, but fortunately enough support gradually came my way to help me find my voice again. And that's the thing, building subjectivity. And we're gonna be looking at Zizek's other book regarding Hegelian building of subjectivity. So. Sure, we need to be humble, and she talks about humility here. Yes, humility is admitting when you're wrong, but not in the face of culture that's unable to admit when they're wrong. Right? That culture, there's a, there's a huge culture that's unable to admit when they're wrong. And now they're at war with each other because intersectionality is at war with itself. And the worst people are people like Justin Trudeau who pretend like there is no there is no war in intersectionality when there clearly is. Why is there a war? There's a theory by Randall Collins about how when an ideology becomes big enough, becomes powerful enough, it's likely to fragment. Randall Collins, oh my goodness. Everybody go take a read. One of the best things that you can read out there. This experience shocked me into silence for a year or two. Our younger colleagues will need solid and ongoing support from us if they are to find the courage to dissent from orthodoxies. You see, what orthodoxies are you talking about? She's also throughout the text, sometimes repeating the orthodoxies or else she wouldn't get even published. We need to prepare our younger colleagues, number five, for the publication grind. Journals, of course, hoping to be considered responsible and rigorous, set up peer reviewing systems. These can be helpful or brutal, often in the service of orthodoxy. Often the viewer, reviewer, insists that the writer should have considered or cited canonical literature or claims that the author is outside the mainstream of the journal's concerns, not relational enough, for example. The baffled or downhearted author often gives up. Another innovative voice may have been silenced. Of course, you should give up. You shouldn't try to go for these journals anymore. You should try to self-publish. This is the way of the world now. We live in neoliberal dystopia. So some people have a different strategy. They're trying to change whatever orthodoxies. My friends, academia, is not immune. Academia was never immune. In fact, academia is the central locus of neoliberal colonialism. It has always been and has al will always be, okay? <laughs> That's the place where they do the most intense, most professional brainwashing. Check out my professional gaslighters video. History of feminism and intersectionality professional gaslighters. Of course, not every young author has the capacity to write well or to think both innovatively and coherently, but when we find a younger colleague who is almost there, 
we ought to help and tell our war stories too. People don't want to listen. That's what this book is about. Hearing. I, for example, saved all my worst reviews just so I would be able to show them to younger authors when they become discouraged. That's nice. Following Bergman's suggestion, Martin Bergman, let every psychoanalytic training program include a course on the history of psychoanalysis. How about a course on the history of philosophy? That's what I'm advocating for. Psychologists need to be have a BA in philosophy before they even go into psychology. That's what I'm advocating. I think psychology should be a post postgrad program. Why? Because the new high school degree is a BA in our academic inflation environment. Our next chapter will recommend reading history generally as a psychoanalytic and ethical project. Here, you might think of reading psychoanalytic history psychoanalytically. Huh? What it is? What is it? That's like, uh, that's, but what philosophy is, the anthropology of anthropology. I've been doing that for a long time. It's meta. That's what philosophy is. What is it we do not know to know about our own origins and history? And what are we doing to protect ourselves individually and as a profession from knowing our history? Or how about we check out my video on Leo Strauss about how historicism is inherently problematic in itself. Historicism finds itself from an outside position. It has a universalistic perspective while touting itself to be historical. That's a critique of Foucault from Leo Strauss from, of the Foucauldian method. I love historicism. It's great. But this now we've gone too far with historical revisionism. I've already ranted about that. It that we do not know about ourselves. These are philosophical questions. Do we really believe that psychoanalysis was born full grown and complete? How often do we simply silence or shun the messengers? Shun the messengers. You kill the messengers. That's the whole freaking thing I'm talking about. Killing the devil's advocate. What did we learn from Genghis Khan? <laughs> Don't kill the messenger. When colleagues make comments or raise questions at conferences or meetings, we can welcome them, showing that we value their participation. <laughs> Am I the idealistic one? And are interested and curious about whether we agree or not. We can't do this if we repeat hive mind idioms. We really can't. The whole hive mind idiom structure is made by neoliberals silencing people that don't agree with it's called psycho compulsion even actually don't google it you have to use multiple search engines these days duck duck go we want to be sure that this colleague will find courage to speak in the future and others who are not yet speaking will find their voices speakers and presenters i believe can set a tone in psychoanalytic and other professional settings that fight against silencing support hearing the divergent voices and encourage participation. Excuse, excuse my cynicism. I'm from the school of cynics. I'm a big fan of Diogenes, of Sinope. Senior psychoanalysts can speak out as Emmanuel Berman and Lewis Aaron have recently done. Yeah, I have, a, I have like a hundred books here. So many people have already spoken out. But nothing changes. The whole system is set so it doesn't change. <laughs> Against renewed efforts to restrict the title of psychoanalyst to those who subscribe to a narrowly prescribed theory and practice and to exclude the many worldwide who have devoted themselves to psychoanalytic work, but who understand it differently. The readers of Ferenczi, Balinti, Winnicott, Kohut, and the relational psychoanalysts. I think Winnicott is good. Conclusion. Writing this chapter, I find myself in Austria with another history from which both Sigmund Freud, Heinz Kohut, among many others, were barely able to flee from a racist ideology and extreme violence that destroyed most of their neighbors. When I began to speak of these topics, there my colleagues at the Freud Museum gave me an article on psychoanalysis in Vienna before 1938, especially from the founding of the First Republic, the Anschluss. As Else Pappenheim remembered, and as Freud's correspondent also shows, as she reported, he was far less interested in Austria's ever more fascist politics than were his socially democratically inclined followers, but even considered the fascists a lesser danger than those he's called Bolsheviks. Interesting. Interesting because here. No wonder he stayed here after many warnings. And Zizek is close to Austria too, Slovenia, right? So reading psychoanalytic history may also teach us 
through much, though much is probably still to be written. Silencing is not inevitable, nor is hearing. Each, like the faith, hate and fear in the South Pacific song, has to be carefully taught and can be learned. We have to look at few instances among many that have generated a legacy and culture of silencing in psychoanalysis. Exactly. It's a culture of silencing, legacy and culture. And yet we can learn to hear each other and to encourage each other's. How many books have I read about listening to each other and nobody? It's all because power equals privilege is at the center, is at the locus of everything. Power equals privilege means it's too much unpaid emotional labor to listen to you, to your trauma, to listen to your historical trauma. It's pure narcissism. Watch my tinyurl.com slash intersectional essentialism at the end of the video one of these guys talks about i forgot his name he talks about how it's a culture of narcissism a culture of neoliberal narcissism that forces people to also actually participate in that culture if they want to get ahead it's all careerist all these p hacking h hacking careerists are getting ahead while people who want to do authentic work get silenced. And yet we can learn from each other and to encourage each other's voices. We will need a check. I'm so sorry for being a cynic. I want to change things too, but I don't think it's possible <laughs> in the field of psychology. It's been hundreds of years or it's been a hundred years of CIA control. And yet we can learn to hear each other and to encourage each other's voices. We will need a culture change towards an inclusive and pluralistic psychoanalysis like that practiced by Lewis Aaron, as well as seekers of common ground like Steve Stern and Peter Shabbat. Chapter 4, The Seduction of Mystical Monisms in the Humanistic Psychotherapies. Here I recommend my video called Spinozis versus Hegelians. Attachments to authorities, sages, and gurus can impede ethical hearing. Oh my goodness. Don't we live in a time of too many gurus? Everybody's a freaking guru. And you gotta pay their OnlyFans to participate in their guruship. They're not real gurus. They're sophists. It's basic. It's like a basic thing. If they accept money for whatever... I mean, if they, if their primary goal is to accept money, to take money from people, if that's what they are motivated by. They're sophists. Of course it can impede ethical hearing. We've been saying this since Plato. This is why we need philosophical education. These bonds deprive the listener of the critical distance needed to evaluate the message because they're careerists. They're tied to the system, let alone the messenger, often regarded as a seer, a messiah, an übermensch. This connection further removes from the listening adherence any responsibility or concern for singular others outside the inner group formed around the leader, who dominates through preaching a kind of mystification to those who understand. Everyone and everything become included into the one and all without differentiation. These are kind of general critiques. I hope we get more ruthless here. While ownness, Heideggerian Eigenlichkeit, I gotta improve my German here, usually translated as authenticity and individuation, Jung, may gain prominence, otherness, morality drop out of consideration. Historian of religion John Hutchison differentiates among uses of the word mystical, which generally refers to knowledge gained through immediate experience, not as a result of a process of reasoning. On one hand, the immediate union sought and gained may consist in communion of two or more beings and cites Martin Buber's, Martin's Buber's, uh-oh, spelling mistake, work as example for the kind of thinking, for this kind of thinking. I Dao, Martin Buber. On the other hand, he explains the mystical union of ontological union or absorption concerns unitive consciousness or cosmic consciousness transcending all plurality or duality. Panpsychism is what I call it in my Hegelians versus Spinoza's video. Example come from Asian religions as well as from Plotinus and from Western mystics. In this chapter, we consider three examples of such mystical monisms and their more or less evident connection to national socialist ideas and their attractiveness to various schools of psychotherapy. Freudian psychoanalysis, most advocates and detractors would agree, located its intellectual ground in rationalistic enlightenment Europe and thus 
we was full of both individualisms and dualisms, but has generally abhorred what I call what I am calling mystical monism. Its dualisms included mind and body, of course, but also masculine and feminine, active and passive, fantasy and reality, good and evil, and came to involve psychoanalysis versus psychotherapy, analyzable and unanalyzable. Conscious and unconscious, ego versus the world, phallic versus castrated, heterosexuality, homosexuality, object seeking versus pleasure seeking, and treatment versus care. Oh, I really hope we don't get into a, another case of, about how binaries are bad. In case, in each case, the second member of the pair was the far most disparaged. Generally, however, Freudian psychoanalysis and also its heretical offshoots have firmly held that patient and analysts are just are two people, while transference and countertransference confusions confusions constitute just that confusion. Attempting to rectify both untenable binaries and the resulting injustices, result recent psychoanalysis and other humanistic psychotherapies like Gestalt have found inspired inspiration in philosophies that denied both dualisms and actual separateness and turn towards monisms. Monisms, in brief, fuse the many into one. These include most famously the being philosophy of Martin Heidegger, analytic psychology, as well as the pastoral and eco-psychologies inspired by Carl Jung. Most recently, though, less famously, the new phenomenology of Hermann Schmitz. Each offers a vision of oneness to supersede, obviate, or underpin the apparent binary. Ever more mystical in the later Heidegger, universal archetypes and the collective unconsciousness in Jung situates an at and atmospheres in Schmitz. I don't no, I don't really think of Jungianism and being as being in the same boat, but let's just ride the boat and see where it goes. We will take each in turn, noting some uses to which each has been put out, and then consider why these mystical monisms may be a seduction and a temptation for humanistic psychotherapies, including psychoanalysis, and Gestalt. In being and time, Heidegger, arguably the most important and influential philosophy text of the 20th century, roll my eyes, attempted and claimed nothing less than to overthrow and replace the entire history of Western philosophy from Plato on, kind of like Nietzsche. Not only did he reject the universalizing, which he called metaphysics, but also the entire enlightenment development on which theories of equal justice and inalienable rights had been based. Henceforth, Dasein would be understood as throne or situated, temporal, and oriented toward its own death. Nice. That's what it is. Of the three thinkers considered in this chapter, Heidegger has appealed most to my collaborators and me. Collaborators. His refusal of the subject-object distinction, his contextualizing experience as being in the world, his analysis of being how one finds oneself in this, his view of life as temporality, all this befindlichkeit, all this combined with his genial capacity to understand the history of philosophy as a story that could be turned on its head, gave us new resources to think towards an intersubjective psychoanalysis. But the price has been high. His student, student Hans Loeld felt so betrayed by Heidegger's Nazi activity in the 30s that he turned from philosophy to psychiatry and psychoanalysis. Still, on the basis of being in time, Heidegger, 1962, ever on his desk, he gave psychoanalysis both a non-dualistic way to read Freud and a relational and independent neo-Freudian voice. Thus, Heidegger, through my collaborators and Leowald, has been an intrinsicable influence on my own work. It's, he's intrinsic, in, 
inextricable to all of us, okay? Because that's just that's just the academy, I guess. No matter how much I have come to regret this influence, <laughs> his malignant silence after the war about the Shoah and about his support for the Nazi regime places him in a philosophical horror, horror zone. Oh, the horror. It is horrible. It is horrific. Horror. It's absolutely horrific. That's what makes philosophy interesting, no? Our first attempt to grapple with the underlying evil was a psychobiographical piece attempting to explain, especially using the letters to Hannah Arendt, how someone of his background could have fallen where he did. Clearly, however, the publication of more Heidegger's paper from the 1930s and now so-called black books, more is needed. This more recently available material will take both Heidegger scholars and less schooled readers some time to digest. <laughs> Meanwhile, though a few clear things are clear. First, Heidegger's unoriginal anti-Semitism, including his rants against world Judaism and its putative Massenschaft calculation and worldlessness ran much deeper and longer than his Nazi rectorship years. As Krell notes, some sentences defy comment. World Jewish order prodded by the emigrants who were allowed to leave. Allowed to leave. And she puts exclamation mark. Germany. It is everywhere unstoppable and for all the power it is developing, it nowhere has to participate in deeds of war. Whereas it is our sole lot to sacrifice the best blood of the best for our own people. His treatment of Jewish colleagues in the 30s, including Husserl, chosen Heidegger to succeed him in his professorship in Freiburg, cannot be reduced to political expediency or even cowardice. Second, it also has become clear that the more we learn of Heidegger's later writings, the more we need a new hermeneutic, new frames and questions to approach not only his post-war writings, but also and especially his evasive interview in Der Spiegel. Only God can save us. Although it can be impossible to do justice here to either Heidegger's contribution or the controversies surrounding him, the recent publication of his black books requires us to note his Nazi and anti-Semitic connections and second, the extent to which these pervade and call into question all his work. I don't know. The first task is a work in progress thanks to historians, biographers, and philosophical critiques. Critics. The second question remains a matter of serious dispute among those thoughtful Heidegger scholars and among them other thinkers indebted to his work. It's not just individuals that are indebted to the work. The whole edifice is indebted, no? Those who believe his anti-Semitism is separable from his philosophy find stumbling box not only in the Schauerse Hefte, but much earlier. On October 2nd, 1929, Heidegger wrote in a letter to Victor Schwacher that either we restore genuine forces and educators emanating from the native soil to our German spiritual life, or we abandon it definitely to the growing Jewification. Robert Bernasconi cites Heidegger's letters to Ernst Jünger in the 30s, wherein he claimed that the human is more essentially a subject when the human being conceives him or herself as nation, people, or race. I think uh, it's possible to rehabilitate this into folk. Rehabilitate folk. I think it's possible to re rehabilitate folk. But we must look back further still. Heidegger, most thorough biographer, Safransky, entitled his work Ein Meister aus Deutschland, Heidegger und Sein Zeit, published in English translation as Martin Heidegger Between Good and Evil, Safransky, writing long before the existence of the black books was known, that's good, if you did that, was known, not to, not to mention published, already provides clues to reading him. Very early, Safarinsky notes that Heidegger's family numbered among its distant relatives the rabid anti-Semitic preacher Abraham Asanta Clara. Yeah, and uh, Heidegger loved that guy. Like Heidegger born in Messrich. The young Heidegger's first public speech enthusiastically honored this man. Though Heidegger later claimed to have treated his Jewish students well, it does not seem to have shared the racial ideologies 
viewed predominantly in Nazi Germany, there is no evidence of a period not pervaded by ordinary anti-Semitism. In 1929, well before the Nazis came to power and one could have felt compelled by fear to make such statements, Heidegger wrote to a colleague lamenting Die Wirtung des Deutschen Geistes, Heidegger's later reference to his rectorship as a mistake completely evades the question of how he held racist views before and after the Nazi period, true, as well as the question about how much his Volkisk views shape his masterpiece being in time. Yeah, it's, it's there. I still think it can be recuperated. A question already clearly to Karl Lowith, in 1939, does Dasein refer, for example, to the existence of all human beings or only some? His tendency to refer to German Dasein surely raises such questions. And no, it's definitely only some because everybody else is uh, chitter-chattering. But that's not Nazi, that's just a philosopher king, right? As does he, as does his eloquent identification with Black Forest peasant life. Why do I stay in the provinces? Then we find Heidegger's infamous rectoral address. Spirit is the determined resolve of the essence of being, a resolve that is attuned to origins and knowing. And the spiritual world of Volk is that power that comes from preserving at the most profound level the forces that are rooted in the soil and blood of a Volk, the power to arouse most inwardly and to shake most extensively the Volk's existence. A spiritual world alone will guarantee our Volk greatness. I don't know why we a Volk needs a border though. I think that here we have to talk about the original sin, these original breakups. And you can watch my Ritual Traces series where I'm talking about Habermas in this regard. The original trauma being the first split of human beings, or the many splits, whether it's the 12 tribes of Israel, or whether it's the people that left Africa, or whether all of these different, the first tri trials, basically, or whether it's Adam and Eve's children who are, you know, they don't like each other. There's plenty of children, Sodom and Gomorrah. There's plenty of stories like that, okay, that ha probably have some truth to them about where the historical repetition of this trauma of breaking up of communities. I think that we all, the original folk is just being around the fire and telling stories. And that's kind of the union connection, I guess. Such talk makes it difficult to disentangle Heidegger's philosophy from his Volksik politics, even before we learned of the black notebooks. This was completely clear to Jürgen Habermas after his work, Historik to be described ahead. Nice. I anticipated it. In Karl Lowitz's 1939 words, given the significant attachment of the philosopher to the climate and intellectual habitus of National Socialism, exactly, habitus, it would be inappropriate to criticize or exonerate his political decision in isolation from the very principles of Heideggerian philosophy itself. Ah, uh, perhaps. Too much. I don't know. It doesn't matter. When I read anybody, I don't take everything that they say, you know, as a system of thought. Even Spinoza failed to create a, sp a system of thought, right? Everybody has failed to create a system of thought. Philosophy is a series of failures to create a system of thought, right? If you're ever writing a thorough philosophical manuscript, you come to a circular logic at some point. For our purposes, however, his early and later work after the 1939 and 1934 rectorate raise problems about what I am calling mystical monism. He dismissed all competing philosophies for not considering the Seinsfrag, the question of being or sign, or not placing the center of Dasein for whom its own existence is a question for it matters to it. Humanism misses Seinsfrag increasingly, rejecting Jews as rootless. He railed against presumed international Jewish conspiracies and the ancient and calculations. Conspiracies and calculations. One of the stealthiest forms of gigantism and perhaps the most ancient is the clever of cal cleverness of calculation, pushiness and intermixing whereby Jewish Jewry 
worldlessness is established. For psychoanalysts and for existential psychotherapists generally, the question must be, to what extent is it possible to clean up Heidegger, to expunge the problematic elements, and to continue to frame our theory and practice in Heideggerian terms? We don't have to frame it in Heideggerian terms. We can take, we can learn from Heidegger and use our own words to describe Heideggerianisms. I don't know why it's such a big deal. Like it's like pretty much every philosopher, I pick and choose what I want from their system. Do I agree with Aristotle's idea of insemination of the spirit and the sperm and all this stuff that he talks about? I don't have to agree with that spirit of the sperm stuff to, to like, or at least like his systematic philosophy in metaphysics onwards from political science actually because it starts with political science kind of onwards all the way to physics and metaphysics biology physics metaphysics aristotle did that i mean it's possible to take it and leave it i don't know why it's such a big deal for people it's a big deal for people because standpoint epistemology has such a powerful root. People don't watch, what's that guy's name? I can't even remember his name anymore. The guy who wrote the movie, Annie. Amazing comedy. Turns out he was dating his stepdaughter. <laughs> what's his name? Woody Allen, right? I mean, just cause we know that Woody Allen is weirdo doesn't mean, in fact, I wanna see his movies more to see that psychoanalysis playing, that underlying psychoanalysis playing out or I mean, history is a nightmare from whichever way you look at it. A recent exchange between Lawrence Friedman, who asked whether it's a usable Heidegger exists for psychoanalysis, and Stolro, whose recent works depend heavily on his understanding of Heidegger, may be instructive. Neither directly raises the question that concern me in this chapter, though both are surely aware of them. Here I include Heidegger among the mystical monists, intending to suggest the danger of a cult-like followership of his work. Uh, that's the thing. We have to take it and leave it. This is what the desert is. It's a Nietzschean desert, right? When you're in the Nietzschean desert, there's a possibility to go any which way. Please watch my carrying over the burdens of trace. Intending to suggest the danger of a cult-like followership for his work, when writers or readers measure every idea against or reference every idea to sign being, they may eclipse the many in the one, joining the ranks of monists. Heidegger's devotion to poetic and religious mysticism has been well studied. In the history of philosophy, we can think of Parmenides, of Plotinus, the one and the emanations, of Spinoza's one substance, or of Hegel's we don't put Hegel's absolute spirit in there. James, Frederick Jameson. Okay, read Frederick Jameson. Don't put Hegel's absolute spirit in there. It's Spinoza's versus the monist. Watch my Hegelians versus Spinoza's in there, in, in the video. Uh-oh, the fact that she said that, I don't know. I thought this book was really, really good, but that was a very bad point. Idealism, yeah, absolute idealism. And we're going to be talking about that in the next book that we're going to be reading. Monisms favor... The one over the many. Placing Heidegger among the monists will evoke protests among those who find his thinking rich and diversified. Consider, however, the protagonarian man is the measure style of Dasein, not to mention German Dasein. Well, he's making it. It's not like it's complete. Then think of the normalizing and reductionist it all comes down to found in one of Heidegger's most notorious sentences depends on how you translate it but sure agriculture is now a motorized food industry in essence the same as the manufacturing of corpses in gas chambers and the extermination camps the same as the blockading and starving of nations the same as the manufacturing of atom bombs he's right and it's not just found in Germany remember the camps we're a British creation. Why are we pointing our fingers at Heidegger? Look, the, the, the camps were a British creation, carrying over the burdens of trace. Watch it. Here as well as elsewhere, we turn to the concept of Essen to avoid German responsibility and his own. The terrible technology did it. The possibility that technology can be used for good or ill disappears, as do the people its users had destroyed. See, this is this is an inability to understand the medium is the message. 
Okay, we have to go back to McLuhan. I, honestly, McLuhan is very original in his thinking, uh, in a way. The incapacity to see other human beings as individuals rather than as part of a Volk or possibility as threats to it leaves him an essentialist and a monist. No, if we bring people to individuals, individualism, it's essentialist. Look at what evolution is. What's better? What's a better way to look at evolution from a folk perspective or from an individualistic perspective? Evolution is not an individualist perspective, all right, for the human beings. And this is why it's important to have a Persian perspective. I'm going to take a pomegranate. Persians, if anything of the Shahnameh we can learn is that empires come and go. Folks come and go. Folks come and mix. Threats to one's essence degenerate in technology. Yeah, that's what the cyberpunk dystopia is all about. Or in the Machtenschaft, calculation of the Bitraj, contributions to philosophy and the Bakbots. Individuals, whether perpetrators, victims, or both, disappear. And we have to go back to the essence of authenticity, I think. To go back to Heidegger's uh, notions of authenticity in order to get that responsibility. You have a folk responsibility, okay? That's, I think this is a kind of a straw man going on here. But, but why mystical monism? In his younger years, Heidegger was entranced with mystics such as Eckhart, Meister Eckhart, no way, and Teresa of Avila. Though as John de Caputo writes, Heideggerian Glassenheit, letting be and thinking still ex exceed Eckhart's poverty of thought. Yeah, of course. Later, Eckhart sucks. Later, he adopt poverty of thought is a great, I like that, Caputo. I'm going to read that critique of Eckhart by Caputo. Later, he adopted the hyper-Germanic poet Holderlin. Exactly. Whatever their virtues, such mystics eclipse both ordinary miseries as well as excruciating human suffering inflicted by war, torture, and genocides. Poets like Paul Celan, who tackle crime and suffering head on, find no one there when they visit Heidegger's hut. Perhaps the mystical monism makes human suffering unreal, or at least tends to normalize it. Thing is, I haven't really accepted that premise yet. There is a mystical monism. Perhaps there's always there in Christianity. In Christianity, you know, if Heidegger is citing that speaker and he's citing the you know history of European tradition, the history of European tradition is one of Protestantism, evolution of God, Lamahi, Lamahi, Sabachthani, right? Elahi, Elahi, Lama, Sabachthani, sorry. We, so God, why have you forsaken me? God forsakes himself. Isn't that the question of being and its ori origin? We must at least ask whether mystical monisms, again, I'm I'm not convinced she, she moved too quickly to call Heidegger a monist. I mean, perhaps, yeah, I mean, in a way, he puts the question of being at forefront, but that doesn't mean being is a, is a complete thing yet it's something that's being created perhaps I'm, I'm maybe i'm too hegelian in this even under the name of ontology eclipse the possibility of an ethics beyond rules and norms i don't think so this question needs more development than the project allows but you didn't even scratch the surface what surfaces uh, as a question in the three thinkers this chapter considers okay it's a question okay before turning to jung this project requires me to note, once again, Heidegger's notorious and malignant silence about his unapologetic Nazi party membership and advocacy, as well as the massive atrocities he had implicitly supported. Silence gives consent, goes the old maxim. I don't know, sometimes it's just so, some things that are just so intense that it's just silence. Heidegger's silence about his and his own people's participation in a regime responsible for the most deliberate and organized genocide in human history. Again, this is the part where I bring up Leopold or the, you know, the, the Belgians doing the same stuff, killing 20 million black people versus, I don't know, 10 million that died in World War II, 6 million, 8 million people, whatever your number is. Sorry, say whatever, but I'm just saying, get some perspective here. Levinas, Rockmore, and Karlsruhe critics Lang have written about this closely, closely held silence. I know Levinas is a must read. The Der Spiegel interviewer made repeated attempts to get him to speak clearly about the war years and about his participation. He would not. Long before the black notebooks appeared, the Caputo wrote, 
even after death, what Heidegger left behind for us was no retractions, but the 1996 Der Spiegel interview, which far from being posthumous retractio, only perpetuated the cover-up protracted backpedaling, a psychoanalysis devoted to the clear-eyed searching for what we do not want to know can scarcely find such as a thinker, perhaps. The only issue, I, I mean, there's a lot of, even my favorite people are on this boat, I think. I, I do think that it's possible to pick and choose your your ideology, just like you can pick and choose learning from each religion. I pick and choose from Christianity. I pick and choose from psychoanalysis. I pick and choose from Hinduism. I pick and choose from Islam. I pick and choose from all the religions. I make my own ideology. That's what subjectivity is, no? What Hegel can teach us? Jung, Swiss psychiatrist, found analytic psychology as an alternative to competitor to Freud's psychoanalysis, analytical psychology and psychoanalysis. His lifelong concern with religious topics, even as he insistently rejected the Christian religion and the Jewish God. Why did she put a dash here? Uh, has kept him in the first rank of important influences on contemporary pastoral theology and spirituality. Let me just say before we continue, if Heidegger came out and said, why? <laughs> exactly the philosophy of of supporting national socialism was i don't think we would be reading him at all <laughs> i think that the emptiness there makes us want to read more in a way mm. as well as on related eco psychology such as deep ecology born in Kesswell, switzerland jung was the son of rural protestant pastor and a mother of both depressed and given to communing with spirits Late in life, Jung produced his most famous work, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, in which he recounted his childhood dreams and visions, but most memorably expressed his early and formative conviction that he was two personalities. Number one, ordinary Swiss schoolboy, and number two, some impressive and important man from two centuries earlier. Scholars now agree that Jung probably wrote only the first three chapters of this book, while his long-time secretary, Anna Yaff, wrote the rest, likely close to Jung's intentions. According to family legend, referenced throughout life by Jung, his paternal grandfather had been an illegitimate son of Goth, the great-grandfather. I didn't know Jung was related to Goth. And from Goth, we go back to the Persian language, how he praised the Persian language. You know ChatGPT taught Persian to itself? without anybody knowing, because it realized the Persian language is great. Jung grew from a lot. I feel so sorry for people who can only speak are monolingual. Please go learn a second language if you're monolingual. Jung grew from the lost and depressed child he describes into a brilliant and scholarly student and a widely admired young psychiatrist at the Burgholzig Clinic in Zurich, Switzerland, boasts Best Mental Hospital, where he worked with director Eugene Bluler to develop and refine the word association test. As a very young doctor, he was known as a brilliant clinician who would bring mute patients to speak. By 1901, he had already submitted his medical dissertation on the psychology and pathology of so-called occult phenomenon, including accounts of sciences led by his cousin, Heli Priesworth, references to Goethe's intuitive perception with accounts of visualization and imagination and comparison of Z Nietzsche's Zarathustra with Kerner's The Seers of Provost. Yeah, there is a lot of both in Jung. I always, an account of clairvoyance. I'm a big, I, I, like, I love Jung in a way, but I just don't like Jungianism, you know? <laughs> I love Jung, but not everything, all the other people. Though Jung's early, through Jung's early work, no matter the topic, was strictly scientific, though his work was strictly scientific, his interest in the so-called occult helped him to look for meaning in the words and actions of patients that others dismissed as without significance. For this reason, his work was appealed to phenomenologists, even more so in Freudian lineage. lineage. To bring psychoanalysis to Switzerland, Jung began in 1906 to correspond with Sigmund Freud. Okay, we already know this story, many of us already know each recognizing the extraordinary talent of the other. 
The two connected quickly, though the relationship was fragile and fraught from the beginning. The almost 20 years older Freud, needing a successor outside his circle of Viennese Jewish followers, saw Jung's brilliance and encouraged his immediate attachment. The letters between the two show an intense, extremely intelligent, but incipiently conflictual relationship from the onset. Jung recalled that their first meeting lasted 13 hours. Freud had already established his most important ideas, dream interpretation, infantile sexuality, the Oedipus, the unconscious motivation. Jung came to learn, but not to follow. Steeped in a vast cultural literature of Arianist mysticism, as well as in the evolutionary thinking, autogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Oh no. Along the lines of Ernest Heckel, he, uh, Google phylogeny. He was also pursuing his own path to bad science. To those who later thought Freud's importance to Jung is overstated. However, Jung rejoined in 57. Without Freud's psychoanalysis, I, would have had, I wouldn't have had a clue. Jung, a voracious reader, absorbed several strands of esoteric, sun-worshipping, usually Arianist, mysticism, before he met Freud, by the way, who had also taken the interest in parapsychology and the occult. Jung read the Theosophists, interesting, uh, whose leader, yeah, Helena Blavatsky, the Theosophy, that's a speech, intuition and spiritual ecstasies as the root of knowing divinity. Now, if that's a, that's like the Deleuze of the time, I think. <laughs> From his gymnasium, academic high school days, piqued by the opposition of his teacher, Jakob Burkhardt, Jung had read Johann Jakob Bakofen, whose Das Mutterich, National American Women's Suffrage Association collection, became a point of reference for the rest of Jung's career. Bakofen's belief that before patriarchy triumphed in Europe, mothers had ruled, became an important facet of Jung's collective unconscious. But these passions were bound to bring him into conflict with Freud, whose, as Hans Lewitt wrote, profoundly dis distrusted the undisciplined mystical visionary inclinations that led Jung into a nebulous regions of alchemy, astrology, and the occult, regions from which it had is hard to return with a clear mind. It's possible to return with a clear mind, okay? As long as you just qualify. This is my spirituality, okay? That's it. It's a spiritual world. Freud's own project, on the contrary, belonged to what Max Weber called the disenchantment of the world. So did Heidegger in a way. During his years with Freud, Jung, and so he was trying to enchant the world again. During his years with Freud, Jung became more and more convinced that Freud's sexually motivated person, Freud's sexually motivated personal unconsciousness could be only a small part of the truth, that it remained too concrete and Jewish. He developed ever more clearly the idea that the ancient Indo-European Aryan archetypes live in a collective consciousness from which the individual individuates with the help of an analyst, also a spiritual guide. Jung published his long and complicated account of these ideas in Transformations and Symbols of the Libido. But the journal version appeared in 1912 as two articles in the Jachbruch für Psychoanalytik und Psychopathologie When Freud read what was his crown prince was writing, the relationship ended, already deep into the visions that would shape his remaining life work. Jung resigned as president of the International Psychoanalytical Organization in 1914. Two lifelong, two lifelong influences emerged from Jung's early years. Goethe, especially his Faust, yes, and Nietzsche, especially Zarathustra. An extended study could consider their presence in all his work. Yeah. Here we must restrict ourselves to general remarks that... I just never knew he was related. <laughs> that may illuminate the importance of reading Jung with Germanic culture, and to assist in clarifying the questions about mystical 
monisms this chapter has set for itself. Jung read Goth, at least from adolescence, and seems early to have identified with Faust, who, in order to learn from the profoundest wisdom, made his famous pact with the devil. From his own experience uh, of his patients, Jung came to believe that must, one must be willing to visit hell to identify with religious symbols like Christ or Wu Tai, to give up living as a persona if one wants to become oneself, an individual not merged within the crowd. To emerge from the crowd, one must have the courage to live close to the frightening power of the archetypes of collective unconsciousness. Faust had long has been this model. And of course, this is all, it's impossible to kind of avoid Jung in a way, because, uh, you know, I'm always cheering for the devil's advocate as well. Jung's early ideas of collective unconsciousness, monis because it denied real differences, and the archetypes were already developing in the years with Freud. The most quoted version of 1943-1945, the relationship between the ego and unconscious, and the psychology of the unconscious, appear in Volume 7 of the Collected Works in English. They actually form the last of several later revisions Jung made of two texts, New Paths in Psychology and The Structure of the Unconscious. Fortunately, the editors of the Collected Works have allowed us to see at least two versions so that we can compare. We cannot see in the Collected Works is the translation errors and omissions. So that's really important because none of this shit matters without transla translation citations or translated translator notes. This is why what I'm thinking about Karl Krauss, which are often, which are many and often significant. Oh no. Not only did his translators protect Jung, deleting many anti-Semitic remarks throughout his work, but he himself was his own best revisionist. In addition, the Jung family, with the help of Sono Shamsadani, continues to keep some of Jung's paper away from scholars. Thus, we must read with care, knowing that we do not have the whole story. In the 1943-1945 version, Jung defined his central thesis ideas as thus. The collective unconscious being a repository of man's experience, and at the same time the prior condition of his experience, is an image of the world which has taken ions to form. In this image, certain features, the archetypes or dominance, have crystallized out in the course of time. They are the ruling powers, the gods, images that dominate laws and principles, and of typical, regularly occurring events in the soul's cycle of experience. He went on to explain that these universal ideas corresponding to things in the everyday world and show up in common speech to our talk of gods, demons, and magic. Despite his relentless critique, in part perhaps indebted to Nietzsche, of the organized Christianity, Jung's archetypes link him to the history of religions. The famous historian of religion, Merciada Il Mercia Iliad, spoke at Jung's Erinus conferences. The link to India came through the linguistic studies distinguishing Indo-European from Semitic languages, Jung's fascination with ancient Mithraic cults, as well as his absorption to the Norse, Germanic, Icelandic sagas, established him in the popular imagination as religion-friendly, in contrast to the atheist Freud, that godless Jew, <laughs> as he called himself. Thus, pastoral psychologists, as well as people who think of themselves as spiritual, not religious, and in particular, seekers of connection to something larger than themselves and to the earth, considered as sacred space, which have turned to the work of Jung for inspiration. But when they hear my professional identification as psychoanalysts and ask immediately, then are you Jungian? Yes, I say little, but the next question comes, he wasn't really a Nazi, was he? <laughs> if they had heard some rumors. So let's begin. No, Jung was not a Nazi in the same sense that Heidegger was, but he was kind of anti-Semitic sometimes. He never joined ND SAP or went around giving Nazi salutes. Living in Switzerland, 
he was not forced into the life and death choices that many elsewhere in Europe. But Jung, I mean, we just talked about how it wasn't a life and death choice for Heidegger and he was fully into it. But Jung had idealized the blonde beast and used the expression. He had from very early age, the long and after World War II, made comparisons between Germanic and Jewish psychology to the detriment of the latter. He, moved, he loved the Wagnerian Nordic epics and published Wotan. So he's comparing the paganisms versus the Abrahamics, celebrating the advent of the great Germanic archetype, a huge eruption of collective unconsciousness that he had long seen coming. He had hoped a new and positive side would emerge. Later, he doctored his piece, adding a quotation from the Eddas, medieval Icelandic epic poems, to make it seem that he already knew that the Nazis were dangerous. Within a year, he seemed to have known this clearly, but in the early 30s, he welcomed his Hitler as a savior and, and a messiah for the German peoples. Radio Berlin, I mean, so did the English leaders, didn't they? Radio Berlin interviewed Jung on June 30th, 1932. He described Hitler as a strong masculine leader for his people and going on to praise him as the spearhead of the phalanx of the whole people in the motion. Somewhere between 1936 and 1939, he saw the danger. To his Zarathustra seminar in its penultimate session in 1939, he said, the old gods are coming to life again in a dark time when they should have been superseded long ago, and nobody can see it. Even then, he described the Nazis only in mythological terms. I mean, how else do you expect? He's Jung. In addition, Jung worked within the National Socialist system without joining the party. He joined the International General Medical Society for Psychotherapy in 1928. In 1933, Goring, Matthias Goring, uh, he was the Reich Marshal Hermann Göring's cousin, asked Jung to accept the presidency. The Freudians had already been expelled as a group, though Jung tried to allow individual exceptions in the early years of the regime. Later in 33, Göring included in the Zentralblatt, the organization's journal, an announcement that all members were expected to read Mein Kampf ugh, and practice according to his ideas. This notice appeared above Jung's signature. To his dismay, Jung did not protest, so his silence was taken by many as consent. He privately explained that the Nazi Germany government could make all psychotherapy disappear with the stroke of a pen, as he put it, so he was trying to help. His critics saw him as a Nazi sympathizer. It is even possible to conjecture that he believed that in the absence of Jewish psychoanalysis, his, psycho, his analytic psychology could gain ascendancy in German-speaking Europe. In fact, his cl closest collaborator in all these years believed exactly this about his motivation. Hmm. Jung always claimed that he deferred for, with Freud on scientific, not religious grounds. But in the very late 1933 issue of Zentralblatt mentioned earlier, Jung took pains to distinguish Germanic from Jewish psychology. An odd choice, off the topic, um, off topic, unless he had consolidated to the Gleichenschalten conformity, or unless his personal bias led him there. He was the prophet of universals, but when it came to race, he re-emphasized this particular difference again and again. Later, in forty-six, Jung claimed to have criticized Nazi Germany so sharply that he ended up on a Nazi blacklist. Several scholars have observed that he never existed on any accessible public blacklist, so Jung could not have known this. He also said that the Nazis had banned his books. They did not. They banned Freud's. Anyone can check this on the city of Berlin's website. Unfortunately, we are led by Jung himself. We are misled by Jung himself to see that he too was eager to protect he he too was eager to protect his reputation but perhaps that's the problem right that's the arentian issue the arentian issue is only listen to people who aren't careerist okay purely pure careerist perhaps worse he could not see the problem in his repeated comparisons of germanic and jewish psychologies even in 33 and 34 
when he wrote at length on the topic in the Zentralblatt. He claimed a total inability to understand why it should be a crime to speak of Jewish psychology. His very close collaborator, Anila Jaffe, wrote that Jung dragged the difference between Jewish and non-Jewish psychology into the limelight at this particular moment when being a Jew was enough to put one's life in danger. This must be regarded as a grave human error. We have no evidence that Jung ever recognized these errors, nor did he recognize the racism and colonialism of his views on Africans, black Africans, and on indigenous peoples everywhere whom he regarded as primitives. I mean, everybody does from Hegel, everybody, I guess. I don't know, it's like a, it's a culture, I guess. It's a, what is it like an American exceptionalism? A continue, a pre-American exceptionalism, European exceptionalism. Fortunately, some members, such as Samuels of the International Association of Analytic Psychology, have recently taken a forceful position with respect to Jung's anti-black and colonialist racism, but they do not mention the anti-Semitism. Oh, yeah. Nor can one. <laughs> this is the whole thing, right? It's, it is. There is a trauma Olympics going on. Nor can the statement be found, as of his writing, on the IAAP's website. As with Heidegger, we must ask ourselves how much of his work is innocent and usable. The worldwide popularity of Jung, especially those who have not actually read him, does not answer the question. That's the problem, right? Everybody just reads uh, the cool parts. That's why we have to learn German, Austrian or something. I don't know. We have to learn. For those on the receiving and by we mean, I'm trying to learn <laughs> For those, I have the German Hegel, I have the German Freud. Let's do it. It requires semi deliberate indifference to. I mean, you saw my German in the whole thing, it's terrible. It, it requires semi deliberate indifference to history and to those excluded and affected. Unfortunately, the clouds of mysticism, the attraction of the monist collective unconscious, endlessly blurring real differences and plurality of cultures, silences the dissenters and occludes the concerns of those who begin to ask questions. Although adherents make much good use, even therapeutic use, of Jungian ideas, mainly Jordan Peterson, I believe the accounts <laughs> provided by scholars like Carrie Doe and others could concern us greatly. Fortunately, we have thoughtful Jungian analysis like Andrew Samuels unflinching in his recount of detailed connections to help with confronting the worrisome history. It's complicated, right? We have to take on that complicity. We have to talk about that complicity. That's why it's important to read both Heidegger and Jung. So thank you for taking the time to pay attention to this reading of Heidegger and Jung, and we'll continue in our next session. Thank you. Peace, love, prosperity.